Hello everyone, welcome back to Data Programming 1. Today we're going to be talking about functions as objects. This is our second lecture on what I'm going to call advanced functions. There is a template, uh, a Jupyter Notebook template on our webpage. Uh, go ahead and go download that now while I'm going through the rest of the announcements. Um, next up, uh, haven't caught anybody cheating yet, but I'm only up through P5. I've still got P6 and P7 to work through. I'm going to be doing that this week. Uh, so if there's any sort of uh, similarity between your work and someone else's, I'm going to be emailing you. Uh, if you've actually cheated and want to confess, that's always best. Uh, please just send me an email. All right, next announcement. Our exam is scheduled for next Wednesday. That is November 4th. And there are practice exams available on our webpage. They're just the exams from previous years. Uh, last spring, there's not an exam from last spring because that was about the time that they sent everyone home for COVID and we didn't have a solution at that point for how to do an online e exam. All right, uh, we're going to make a couple of changes from exam one. First, we will not be using atomic assessments. Uh, they just couldn't handle the load when we have 800 people in class. So we're going to be switching to the Canvas exam, the built-in Canvas quiz module. So you guys are familiar with that. We've been using that for quizzes for the last couple of weeks. Um, the major thing that's going to be different is we're limited in what types of questions we can ask. So you can expect uh, to be mostly multiple choice questions. All right, so as we begin this lecture, the second in the three of advanced functions, I'm going to make the radical claim that functions are actually objects. This has a number of consequences for us. It means that uh, variables, uh, variables hold references to objects. That means we can have a variable that refers to a function. Further, parameters are just special variables uh, that hold references to objects also. So that means we can have a function with a parameter that has a variable that refers to another function. Check that out. We'll do some demonstrations of that before the end of class. Uh, we can also put functions into lists and dictionaries. And lists and dictionaries can contain references to objects and functions are objects. And that means we can actually pass lists of function references to other functions. Um, this is actually going to save us a lot of time programming. There's a lot of clever things we can do um, to add versatility to our functions. All right, I'm going to start out with a relatively simple example here. Um, you should understand everything in this code when I'm done with this slide. Well, this is like 12 slides that break it down. Um, but make sure that this makes sense before you move on. Uh, the rest of the lecture will be very confusing if it, if it doesn't make sense yet. Okay, I want to point out that first, one line in this code is something radically different from everything we've seen so far. Take a minute, stare at this, and see if you can figure out which line is different. All right, in fact, uh, it's this line right here, G equals F. That's the one that's radically different, very new. You may have actually seen this as a bug if you forgot to write the parentheses, like right there, when you're calling a function. So let's go ahead and step through this example. So first line, uh, x is going to create a brand new object. So these brackets will create a new list object. And x, the variable x, is going to refer to that list. There we go. The second line is just going to create another variable. And we're going to set that equal to x. What that means is that y is going to refer to the exact same object that x does. All right, after that, we're defining a function. Now this command, let's take a little more look, a detailed look at it. This says uh, create a brand new function object with all of the code inside. So f should reference a brand new function. And we're going to create a variable f that refers to that function object. Uh, after that, when we say g is equal to f, um, that means that g is a variable that's going to refer to whatever f refers to. This is the important key part. g is a variable that refers to whatever f refers to. Remember in the previous section, f is a a uh, variable that refers to a function object. So both g and f are going to reference that same function object. Okay, and then we're going to wrap up here with z. Uh, z is calling the function f. These two lines are very different. So those parentheses means go run the function f. So z, I'm sorry, uh, function f there goes to this function object, figures out what code to run, figures out what return value to return, and then assigns that return value to z. In this case, it's returning the string high. So 
One way to think about this is f is a, uh, when we call the function, is just going to simplify something down as much as possible, and at the end return whatever that is that we need to store as an object and have z refer to. In this case, it's just the string high. All right, please note that both of these lines do exactly the same thing. So this line z equals uh, f parentheses is calling the function f. That means z is going to, I'm sorry, we're going to start on the right hand side and simplify this. So we're going to trace the arrow from f to the function object, do whatever this says, come up with a return value, and store it back in z right there. This line does the same thing. It's going to look up the variable g for my list of variables, follow that arrow to get the function object, execute whatever code is in that function object, come up with a return value, and store that return value in z. So both f and g are just names for the very same function object. They're uh, essentially aliases. Okay, so check this out. I've got some arrows here. So this line, x creating a brand new list, and this line where we define f, these are very similar. Both of these lines create brand new objects on the heap. They create variables on the stack with arrows that point to it. They refer to those lines. Okay, these two lines, the blue ones, y equals x and g equals f, are also very similar. Both of these create brand new variables on the stack that refer to existing objects. So they just create an, exam, uh, an arrow over to something on the right on the object side that already exists. All right, check it out. These two lines are very different. This first one here is creating a reference to an existing function object. So basically just giving us an alias for that function object. And this line, the bottom one, z equals f, is very different. This is actually calling or invoking the function, getting a return value from that and assigning that to z. Okay, I'm going to jump over to Python Tutor now and do some coding demos. This is a great place to pause the video and pull that up if you don't already have it open. So I'm going to start off with some just simple examples that kind of demonstrate what's going on. They won't be particularly useful, but then in the second part, we'll do two more examples where we can actually see where this is really applied, some things that may save you some time in the future. All right, so first up, I'm just going to define some functions. Uh, we'll start with the first one, say hi. And this will print, hello there. Can't type today. Whoa, good lord. Hello there. All right. Did I remember all the quotes? Oh, I mistyped that. OK, so there we go, my first function. All right, the second one, I'm going to define, say, goodbye. And this one's going to say, oops, goodbye. It's a function. This one is going to print, let's see here. Wash your hands and stay well. There we go. Very good. All right, now I'm just going to call these functions a bunch of times. Let's do, um, and we'll do say hi twice. Say hi again. Say goodbye. Again. And a third time. Okay, there we go. We can see it's working. It's doing exactly what I want it to. If this at all feels unfamiliar, you should go back and review this, walk through the code on your own one line at a time. Just make sure that you do really understand. Okay, what I want to do next, though, is demonstrate this idea of functions as object. So I'm going to just say that f is equal to say hi. Okay, that's creating a new object over here, a new variable f, that's going to just refer to an existing object. I think I said that wrong the first time. Uh, it refers to the function say hi. And then I can call it exactly the same way. So if I do that, I get the hello there. If I do it again, there's the second hello up in the output. All right, the next thing I can do um, is it's a variable, and variables can refer to lots of different things. So I can do f is now equal to say goodbye, and then I can call f again. Let me just copy this, speed it up a little bit, place that three times there, and Oh, whoops, I made a mistake right here. Check this out. Excellent, excellent learning opportunity, teaching moment. What I've done here is I have forgotten to put in, I, I put in extra parentheses. This is just habit. Whenever I have a function, I do this all the time. I put in the extra parentheses. I was trying to reassign f 
to point to the goodbye function. Instead, what I've done is I've called the function say goodbye right up here. This function doesn't return anything. There is no return statement. So Python automatically puts in a return none. Okay, so f has been reassigned to the value none right here. And then I'm trying to call it. There's probably an error message down here that says none type object is not callable. So that means I've got something that looks like this, none, which is just, a, it means the absence of a return, an absence of a value. It's not callable, it's not a function. I cannot do that. So here's what I need to do, check this out. Those two parentheses are the mistake. I need to delete those. And now check this out. F is now an arrow, a reference to this function object, the say goodbye object. And then when I call it here, here, and here, I'm getting the message printed out. So this is essentially doing the same thing I just did with a uh, function as an object, a reference to a function, instead of calling those functions directly. Now well, technically they are calling them directly. F is just another name for those functions, an alias. All right, just one more little detail. Because all these things are just variables that refer to things, I can actually reassign say goodbye to be say hi. Now when I execute this line, right now um, say goodbye refers to I'm sorry, say goodbye referred to the say goodbye function. Now, say goodbye confusingly is actually pointed to say hi. If I do f equals say hi, that's going to remove this arrow from say goodbye. It now points to say hi. I've got three different arrows, three different variables that all refer to the same function. And in Python, the moment there's an object over here on the right side with no arrows pointing to it, I can no longer get to it. It's not nuked eventually. Um, it's not nuked immediately, it's still there in memory, but we cannot get to it. There is no way to get back to it that I know of. And eventually, uh, every so often, there's a little timer, Python has this garbage collection mechanism that will go through and look for all the memory that's no longer being used. It just keeps track of how many references, as in how many arrows point to that. And if that is ever a zero, it can go ahead and just remove that, free up the memory, and we can use that memory for something else. Okay, so this is just a quick little side. Um, some extra information and maybe a potential bug in your code if you reassign something and remove all references to it then we can't get back to it so be careful of that one all right next up I want to do yet another slightly different version of this much right here so I'm going to delete this uh, I'm going to create a new variable function list and I'm creating a new list I'm going to put those functions in it say hi say hi say goodbye say goodbye and one more say goodbye so it's just a list of functions and remember lists can contain uh, references to objects so here I've got two arrows that point to say hi three that point to say goodbye and now check this out for f in function list I'm just gonna go through my list and call those functions so f calling it when I do this it's going to go through the first time through the list f is going to grab this very first function from the list say hi and it calls that function right here and that's what prints out the first hello there second time through the loop f is going to be equal to this function f is a reference that points right up here check it out so right here in my loop f why is it pointed over there oh oh i'm sorry this is because i'm not walking through the code this is after all the code is executed Forgive me, I confused myself for a second there. Let me actually do it this way. We'll go back to first. We'll get caught up. Next, next. There we go, print. All right, second time through this loop, f is going to refer to the function say hi. Right there, it's going to grab say hi from the list. Then we're going to call that function. It's going to print out hello there. Next time through the list, f is going to refer to the third function say goodbye when we call that function right here in this line we jump up to say goodbye we execute that code prints out wash your hands and stay well next line to execute grabs the next function that's the say goodbye uh, the fourth item at index zero one two three uh, from the function list uh, next line we're going to call this function so it's going to jump up into say goodbye red arrow moves print out wash your hands again uh, stay well bye all right, and I'm just going to, yeah, I think that's good enough for this demo. I can put functions in a list. These create objects that refer to other functions. 
and then I can just call them in a loop. Okay, that was version two. Next up, version three, stuff we can do. I'm gonna just delete that. I'm keeping my two functions. Um, let me do this one for, let's see, i in range two. I'm gonna call, say hi. Calling it for i in range three. Say goodbye. Okay, so this is one way to do it. This is the without creating um, a, a, an alias or another variable that refers to a function. What I'm going to do here, though, is instead, basically what I've got is a loop that calls a function a number of times. Here we are. We're doing the same thing. We're calling a function a certain number of times. So I'm going to go ahead and actually create a function that calls a function a certain number of times. I'm going to call this um, call n times. Okay, and I need two parameters here. I need the name of the function and I need how many times. So there we go, something like that. Now, the name of the function, uh, when I get up here, well, the number of times is easy. We're just going to call that n. Um, but the name of the function, uh, I'm going to be passing in a parameter. And remember, when I pass a parameter, that's exactly the same thing as basically the first line of my code says f is equal to, and then whatever I call it. In this case, I'm going to pass in, say, hi when I do this. So this line right here is going to do this for me. All right. And then let me copy my list up here for i in range. This is not going to be, say, hi. I'm going to call f, and my range is going to be n. So basically, I just took this code right here and I turned it into a function. So it's going to go for n times, whatever I call it as, and call the function f. So now I can replace this with a function call. All right, I know that went by kind of fast because I copied and pasted. Forgive me. Uh, watch that again or stare at it. Pause the video, stare at it till it makes sense. Call n times. All right, I need the name of the function. I'm just going to call this, say, whoops, say hi. That's the function I'm calling, no parentheses, um, because I'm passing in a function. And then I need n times, and we call that twice. All right, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to copy. All right, we'll delete that. We'll paste the copy. And now instead of say hi, I'm going to call the other function. I'm, well, I'm passing the other function to my call n times. And uh, I've been doing three for the second one. Let me upgrade that. And there, I can see the output is correct. But let's go ahead and walk through this from the beginning. So first up, creating a function object, assigning the variable say hi as a reference to that object. Next, creating another variable say goodbye that is referring to an, a function object uh, right here that does has that code in it. Okay, then I'm creating a third function object uh, called call n times. That's a variable that refers to that function object. Okay, so I've got all that code there. Then I'm calling my function call n times. It's passing in the function say hi. So we're adding a new stack frame right here. This has two parameters, f and n. f is a reference to whatever this first parameter is here using positional arguments, and that's a function. So it's just going to refer to this function object. n is, of course, two. So when we step through this for i, we now get an i while we're in the loop. It starts at a zero. Um, we're just calling the function. I'm not indexing into anything. So when I call the function, I get yet another stack frame. Um, it's going to print out hello. The return value is none, which I completely ignore. I'm not doing anything with that return value. And then I'm going to go through the next time through the loop. i is going to become 1. We call the function. We get another stack frame. There we go. It prints out hello there. After this, we go back. i is now 2. It's out of range, so we exit the loop. Uh, return value is none for the function, and we're done with call n times for this invocation. Next up, the red arrow indicates the line to be called next. We're calling call n times with the other function. So when we jump here, we're in call n times. f is a variable that's passed this function as a parameter. So f becomes a reference to this function object. Say goodbye. n is, of course, 3. Just as usual, we've been passing numbers to functions for the past several weeks. If that doesn't make sense, go back and watch some videos from earlier in the semester. 
All right, next up, we're going to be doing for i in range. So i gets a, assigned right there. It starts out at 0. It's going to go 0, 1, 2. And then we're going to call the function. So we get another st stack frame for say goodbye. This doesn't have any parameters. It's just going to print out wash your hands and stay well. Return none, which we ignore. And then we're back in the loop. So i is going to get upgraded to 1. We call the function that adds a new stack frame. We print out hello, return none. I becomes 2. We call the function. It prints out, yep, always. Prints out wash your hands. Return value is none. We ignore that. I becomes 3. Okay, we're now out of range. It stops the loop. This is the end of the function. So call n times has return value of none, which uh, we are not doing anything with. We're just calling the function. We ignore the return value. And program's done. All right, now. I'm going to move over into the part of the lecture where I actually do stuff that you guys might find useful. Some demonstrations of where functions as objects uh, can actually save you time and make your code more efficient, uh, at least writing it, and of higher quality. So here we go. Uh, I pulled up the template, and I'm just going to be doing my work right here. Uh, first up, check this out. This is the first time I think we can see the clock. It actually says PM. I'm not writing this in the middle of the night. Very excited to be 12 hours ahead of schedule. All right, you can ignore the first cell. This is just uh, to make the screen wider. I'm going to put this in full. Oops, put this one in full screen mode. Um, I've got the Python tutor examples here from earlier in the lecture. You can go check out all of these. And then example two, uh, the actual useful stuff. What we'd like to do frequently, we have lists of things. Uh, in this case, a uh, list of uh, strings. We see lists of strings really commonly in several places. First, um, CSV files. Uh, very common. Everything comes back as a, as a string. And so we may get lists of strings uh, that we need to do some sort of manipulation on. And it would be good to have the power to do uh, every item in a list and apply different functions to that item, uh, every item in the list. You know, we may want to do, in this case, we're going to take these and turn them into integers. They come as strings. In part two, if they were dollars, uh, if they had a dollar sign, if we had $456, we're going to be removing the dollar sign and turning it into an integer. And then finally, we'll take some strings with letters and turn them into uppercase. All right, the other place that's really common for us to get a list of strings that we may want to do something with is that sys.argv. And this is going to be given to us from command line parameters. Uh, so very common, those two situations, we're going to ha have strings that we need to do something with every item in the list. Okay. So what I'm going to do, in fact, what I would recommend that you guys do is pause the video after I'm done explaining and try and write this function on your own. Get as far as you can until you get stuck and then come back and watch the video uh, and maybe see the differences between your strategy and what I'm about to do. So go ahead, give this a try. Uh, if you're watching the live stream, I'm not going to pause the video. I'll just go through it. Uh, if you're at home watching YouTube, definitely give this a try. Try and use this as a guided learning activity. Uh, at this point, you guys have everything you need to be able to do this. All right, so I'm actually going to start right here. Um, when I apply the function everything, I've got a list. I'm going to be calling apply to each. Um, it's going to take two parameters, uh, the object reference, so that's going to be L in this case from right here, and a function object. And it tells me I'm going to be using the int function object right there. Oops. So what this is going to look like is I'm going to be giving it L and int. And then I'm going to go up here and take a look at uh, walking through this, creating the function. So I'm creating a function. So def, I'm writing a function called apply to each. Um, this is going to take a list. I'm going to call this list inside my function. I'm going to give it a new name. I'm going to give it original values, so we'll just abbreviate that, origvals, and this is going to take a function that we're going to apply to everything. In the first case, I'm going to be demonstrating this with int. The next case, I'm going to just remove dollar signs from some money. Um, so this is going to take different functions, which is why I'm doing it this way. Okay, first up, uh, let's just print out originvals and make sure that this is working. All right, next up. I'm actually going to copy and paste this line right up here so I can run my code 
and because I need something to call this function for testing. This is perfect example. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll do control enter and find out I made a mistake. L is not defined. Oh, I never ran this cell. All right, control enter. Now Python knows that this is a list that's available to me. Run this cell, and we see that the it's printing out my list with all of the string elements in it. So that looks like it's working. Perfect. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is we're going to loop through all of the pieces, uh, things, uh, pieces of data in original vows. So for, and let's just call this um, v for value in original vows. Yep, and we'll just print it out. Print v. Let's see here. Um, control enter to run this. Yep, one twenty three four five six. Uh, now when we print out something, these are still strings but the print function on a string doesn't put the quotation marks in for us. So let's see here. Oh, I'm not following my directions. Initialize a new empty list for output. All right, so we're going to need that. We're going to need to turn these guys into integers and then add them to this list. So to do that, let's see here, I need a new empty list. How about, what do we call this? New vowels. So that'll be my list. And that's going to be an empty list just like that. Next up, instead of printing these out, what I'd like to do is turn them into integers. Okay, now if I were to do this, I would say new val, so this is just one value. This is gonna be int, and then I'm gonna give it v. All right, that's what I would do if I wanted to turn this into an integer. Um, let me just make sure this works. So we'll, um, let's see what we'll do. We'll add this to new vowels, new vowels, dot append new val singular there we go that should add this to the end of the list and then when we get all done we should see that apply to each has created a list we just run this oh, i need to print it out print there we go none oh i forgot to return new vowels so i created it it's a good thing i checked that out return new vowels. There we go. There we go. And I should be able to see that it's turned all of these values into integers. So before, actually, I'm just going to leave it like this. All right. Now, instead of calling the int function, I want this to work with lots of different kinds of functions that I can apply. So I'm going to be passing in int. And instead of calling it directly right there, this is going to be calling whatever f is referring to. And that's referring to this built-in Python function that turns something into an integer. Maybe, let me just demo this real quick right here. If I do int and then I give it a string, that's going to just change this back into an integer. Uh, we've used this a bunch of times, but I don't think we've ever done something quite as weird as passing it, assigning it to a variable, and then calling it like this. All right, um, let's see, did I finish everything I wanted to do? Initialize a new empty list. Check. Process each item. That's my loop right there. Apply the function passed as argument to the second parameter. Um, yep, so there's the argument, the function. Yep, and that's what I'm doing right here. And, whoops, that should be add. Get that fixed. Add the transformed item to the output list. Right there we append it. And return the output list. Return. It's looking good to me. All right, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, I'm going to move on and go ahead and do the next. All right, the next example is, suppose I have a list of strings that have dollar signs in them. So this is money. Um, and what I want to do at the end is turn this into just plain integers. So step one is going to be to remove all those dollar signs. So I'm going to run this cell. Control Enter will run that. It's now got a 10 here, so I can see. And if I want, I can go up here and print out L again. And I get my list uh, exactly like below with the dollar signs. All right. In fact, wait a second. I want to do this all in one cell so that as you guys restart and run all, it's not messed up. Okay. So there I've got L. Let me actually do this one more time. There we go. Still looking good. Now, what I want to do is write another function called strip dollar, and that's going to go and will apply to everything in the list. So at the end of this, I'm going to apply to each L and this is going to be my strip dollar function just like that that's how I'm going to call this all right so before this will work I need to define 
my strip dollar function. Yeah. Um, functions that begin with word strip are very common. Uh, it's it means that we're going to be doing something to a string to remove things from it. Okay. So in this case, uh, strip dollar needs to take a string. I'm just going to go ahead and call this. Um, how about s? It will be a string. And now there's a really really easy way to do this. I'm going to be returning something. Um, and that's just s is my string dot remove no place replace I'm gonna replace the dollar sign where is it there it is shift four with nothing okay this should work all right so what it'll do um, here let's actually print this out and just test this okay yep so here let me do a, a little better a little better job of like walking through it I'm, I'm gonna print out s every single time we go through this and then uh, We'll make sure we're getting dollar one, twenty-three, dollar is twenty-four. Okay. Instead of returning it immediately, I want to make. Well, I guess I don't need to do that. I can see that it worked right here. Uh, printing out the entire list all at once at the end. I can see the dollar sign before the one was removed. The dollar sign between the four hundred fifty-six was removed. All right. Then I can go ahead and let's see. I'm going to just reassign this to L again. So L is going to be equal to that new list. I don't need these parentheses. And next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to call apply to each one more time. And instead of strip dollar, I'm going to give this int. All right, uh, control enter will run that. It's printing out S right here. I need to actually write the result out. There we go. Now it's removed all the quotation marks. And I have a list of integers instead of a list of strings. All right, one more little detail. Uh, Mina did this a little bit more difficult using a t more difficult technique than I did. She's going to check whether an input string begins with a dollar sign. I just said if there's a dollar sign anywhere in the string, get rid of it. Um, so I'm going to upgrade this a little bit and do it her way. Okay, so first we're going to check to see whether the input string begins with a dollar sign. That's s dot starts with, and then I need to give it the dollar sign. Shift 4. I never find that one. Okay, if it does, this will return true, and then I can um, return the rest of the string. So instead, return, and this is going to be s. I'm going to create a brand new string by starting with element 1 and creating a slice. I'm going to slice the string that removes everything but the first character. All right, and then this line was the easy way. I'm going to leave this here um, so you guys can come back to it and see the easy way. Uh, it may not do exactly what you want, though. In this case, I know that I'm... Where's my... Yep, my list. I know that the dollar sign is always first. It doesn't have weird, like, something like that. My version will remove all three of those dollar signs. Uh, this starts with will not. It assumes you actually have clean formatted data. Uh, so it depends on what you really want. We may need more than one version of strip dollar. You know, we might create a function that says remove all dollar signs. Uh, in this case, it's just going to be removing the first one. All right, let me just verify that this works, uh, that I didn't make any typos. Oh, check this out. I did make a mistake. I have a semantic error here. So the code ran, but it is not doing exactly what I want. So check this out. For It's printing out all the numbers to start with. So this is the input data. So it's just printing out $1. If it starts with a dollar sign, and only if it starts with a dollar sign, then we're going to return something. So returning the string... So in this case, one without the dollar sign. If it does not start with a dollar sign, we do nothing. And then it's going to return none. Uh, I think this is a great teaching moment. So instead of doing it like this, um, I need something like this, else return s. Because s does not start with the dollar sign. All right, let me run this and make sure that I'm actually getting that 23 to still be there. All right, perfect. All right, so that's now working. I'm going to go ahead and put back my apply to each for the int, and now I should get a string, uh, I'm sorry, a list of just integers. All right, next demonstration. Here's what I want to do is use more built-in functions, but I'm going to be using the built-in methods. So if you remember, a method was something that's called with an object dot, and then like um, upper. So if I do this, it's going to take all the letters in this string and move them to uppercase. But what I really need 
is something that I can call like this because I'm going to be passing the name of a function um, and this is not going to work. I, in fact, I get a name error. Upper is not defined. <clears throat> so uh, the important thing to remember is that for methods, we had two different ways to call them. And the other one was to give it the name of the type. In this case, this is of type string dot upper. And now I can give it the string. So when I run this, it totally works fine now. Okay, so this is how I call a method where I'm not actually using the object or the string as the like um, thing that I'm calling it on with the dot notation. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. I can um, call my function apply to each. I'm going to give it this new list L, which is the A, A, B, 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 C, C, C. And I'm going to give it the function. So you check this out. Upper will not work. I can't just give it the function upper. Um, <clears throat> Uh, upper is not defined. It's part of this string module, so I have to call it like this, string upper, and now it's transformed my list to a, a, b, 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 c, c, c in uppercase letters. All right, next up, I just want to mention that applying something to every single item in a list is so common that Python has a built-in map function that's going to let us just go ahead and do this um, without having to write our own apply to each. Uh, it's just map, <clears throat> and then I need to give it the name of the function and the list. So in this case, I can do int and l. And that's the exact same thing as doing apply to each. Um, one little caveat, map is actually returning something known as a generator. That's actually the next lecture. But the important thing to note is that generators can be used as inputs to lists. So all I need to do is write list map. And that will take this generator and populate the list with all of these guys turned into integers. Let's go ahead and run that. So quick demo. There's not really more to it. I, we'll be exploring generators in the next lecture. So I'm going to come back to it then. Um, hopefully this is clear. It's just essentially doing the exact same thing as apply to, to each that we just wrote. All right. Example number two. I'm going to be talking about sorting here. In this case, I have a list of tuples with uh, just names, with first name, last name. So Catherine Baker, Alice Clark, Bob Adams. The important thing to note that if I actually call names.sort, uh, all of these tuples, sorting is done based on whatever is the very first element. So we're going to get Alice, Bob, Catherine. It'll come out in that order. Now, it's actually really common that we might want uh, names sorted by last name first. So <clears throat> we need to be able to tell Python uh, what criteria we want to use for sorting. Uh, we may even want to do something weird, um, like sorting by the length of their name. Uh, writing a sorting function, it can be painful. There's actually active areas of research trying to come up with more and efficient and better ways to sort things. Um, it can be complicated and prone to errors, or we might just write something that's not very efficient. So what we'd like to do is use Python's built-in sort module, sort function, uh, method, sort method uh, for the list, and but we want to be able to give it a little more information. We want to be able to pass in uh, some sort of criteria to help it know what we will uh, find important and what we want to sort by. So the way this works is the sort method actually has a keyword parameter uh, named key. To be honest, that is a very poor name because it makes me think of dictionaries where we have key value pairs. That's not what this means here. This key takes uh, a function. And in this case, I'm calling it extract. I'm going to be extracting from my uh, tuple of names, the one that I find important. Okay. And what all this does is it's going to return um, something that's going to go into a less than. So essentially sort needs to say that Alice Clark is less than Bob, and that means it's going to put Alice Clark first in the list before it puts Bob Adams. So it's going to have, it's going to call this function twice, this function right here, and it's going to put whatever this returns on the left side of a less than and on the right side for the other object, and do that for comparison. So what I need to do is return the criteria that's important. And in this case, uh, if I'm sorting by last name, I need to write a function that returns the last name, 
which uh, if we didn't do this, the default value would be the first name if I left this out. So in this case, I'm gonna be extracting the parameter from the tuple that I find important. All right, let me walk through this a little more. If I sort by last name, um, Bob Adams will come before Catherine Baker. Let's see here. To sort by the length of the name, I'm gonna go through and do these in Jupyter Notebook where I can like uh, use much greater detail. But I, again, this is gonna return whatever I want on the left side of a less than and for the other object, the right side. So in this case, if I'm returning the length of the first name, Bob only has three letters, Alice has five letters. When it does this comparison, it'll decide that Bob needs to come before Alice in the sorted list. Um, Catherine has the most letters, she needs to come last because Catherine is not less than anything else. So uh, this is going to return this list. Shortest name, medium name, longest name. All right, so let's go through and create a custom sorting technique on a list of dictionaries. Um, I'm going to be doing hurricanes because I wanted to have more columns so I can write more functions to sort on different things. So not the names, but it's the same concept and this will work very well for those other things. Um, I'm also using dictionaries, which are slightly more complicated to extract things from, so hopefully this will be a good example. Um, so I have hurricanes. This is a list. It contains three dictionaries. Those dictionaries have uh, identical keys. So we have name, year, and speed. And then I've just got, I named them A, B, and C, uh, different years and different speeds. So if we're to sort by name, they're already sorted by name. That's perfect. If I sort by year, then I've got Hurricane B will be first, Hurricane C next, and Hurricane A will be third. And if I sort by speed, then again A, then, whoops, oops, this is B, then A, then C. So it'll give us a different order. So we can make sure this is working. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and run this cell with Shift Enter. So now Python knows that I've got hurricanes in here. Hurricane 0, print that out. That looks like it's working. Name A, year 2000, speed 150. Let's make sure that Hurricane one is in there. Yep, that one is B. All right, now to sort things, I need to know if one hurricane is less than another, and then I can put them in the right order in the list. Now, when I run this cell, I'm just going to do Control Enter. This is going to give me an error. And again, it's telling me right here at the bottom that to sort, I need the less than operator. And less than is not supported for instances of dict and dict. I can't have one dictionary less than another dictionary and give me back a true or false. All right, and for the same reason, I can't do this either. I can't call sorted. Let me do a control enter here. I get the exact same error because this sorted function is actually using this less than to decide if one dictionary is less than another. All right, so in order to fix this, we need to write um, that special key function that Python is gonna use when they call sort or sorted to figure out what to put on the left side of the less than and what to put on the right side of the less than um, so that it can actually you know, use that comparison. So here, um, we're gonna go ahead and define a get year. So then when I call sorted using the get year, it will um, sort them by year. All right, let's just dive in and do this. So I'm gonna do define a function get year, just like it's telling me to. This is gonna take a hurricane as a parameter. So I'm just gonna call this h. Okay, um, and let's just start out by printing out h. All right, and then I'm going to call my function to test it. So get year, and then we'll give this hurricane zero, just like that. So hurricane zero was the first one in the list. Let me make sure this works. Hurricane, hurricanes. There we go, was the first one on the list. So it's gonna be Hurricane A, year 2000, speed 150. Now, instead of just printing the whole thing out, what I need to do is return, um, what do we want to return? H dot year. Oh, that's not how you do it. Wait, Mike, you're more. Hurricane, key lookup. Hurricane, there we go. And now it's returning the year 2000 right there. Perfect, that's exactly what we want. All right, I'm gonna get rid of this print H. I no longer need that scaffolding. And now we can go ahead and call sorted using the get year function. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do it right here. Sorted, we'll be sorting hurricanes. And the key is gonna be my get year function. 
Hopefully I'll spell that correctly. And now when I do that, what we should find out is that, hmm, I'm getting some stuff I didn't expect. I think when I went ahead and deleted my print statement, my scaffolding, I didn't rerun that cell. Let's go ahead and do this again. There it is, okay. Now I got rid of those extra scaffolding lines that I, I didn't tell Python to re-evaluate my, what is this, cell 39. Okay, so now when I've sorted the hurricanes, uh, we see that they are indeed sorted by year of 1980, 1990, and 2000. All right, I just want to do one more thing, uh, just to kind of go through like in a little more detail how this is working. And I'm curious, how many times does it actually call get year? Check it out. We never called get year directly. It's not here. I never called this function. I tested it up here, but in sorted, uh, the sorted function is going to be using get year. So if I put in a print statement, uh, then I can actually see when it's called. So we'll go ahead and print uh, get year called, and we'll go ahead and print out H. So that will print out the hurricane as it's called. All right, I'm just going to run this. So now I've updated my function. Here I'm testing it. Get year called. It seems to be working. Now when I call sorted, I've got two things going on here. The first three lines are that um, debugging statement right here. So I can see that it's called for A, B, and C. So it's called exactly three times, which makes sense. I need to be able to extract this data for every single hurricane so I can compare and know where they go in order. And then after it's sorted, uh, I can see that, yeah, we got 1980, 1990, 2000. It is indeed working. Okay, so, whoops, 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 typo there. Did I mess something up? All right, next thing I'm gonna do um, is go through and do a get speed function. So again, I can do sorted to change what I'm sorting by. And I'm gonna go ahead and start out with this one. My get year function does almost exactly what I want. It's just, I need to get speed instead. So in get of, instead of get year, I'm gonna name this, oh, good Lord. Oh man, I cannot type today, get speed. And then I'm gonna get rid of this scaffolding I'm going to say get speed called, and we'll go ahead and take that out in a second. But instead of returning the year parameter, I want to return the speed parameter. So, and that is right here. That's one of the keys. So every time uh, Python needs to sort, it needs to look up the speed. And again, whatever I'm returning right here, it's going to get called for it. So I'm, I'm comparing two hurricanes. They're dictionaries. I need to put something on the left-hand side of a less than, something on the right-hand side of a less than, and then I can decide which one goes first. In this case, I'm going to be sorting by speed. So uh, this should be enough. I should be able to run this cell, and then let's see. I should be able to... Let me just test it right here with sorted. Sorted hurricanes, and key equals get speed. We run this. Yep. Get speed called. It's called for all three of them. So Python's going to take note of their speeds, decide that 100 is less than 150, so Hurricane B will be first, and then 150 is less than 250, so A will be next, and then C, bringing up the rear with the highest speed. All right, so one thing I'm looking at this thinking, maybe I don't want them listed from slowest to fastest. Maybe I'd actually prefer that they were listed in the reverse order. Um, and Python provides a way to do that also. So I'm just going to make a new line here. We're going to call sorted again. Get speed is our parameter that we're going to, the criteria we're going to use to sort. But it has a, Python has another keyword. Reverse equals, in this case, I'm just going to assign this to true. Whoops. I spent too much time programming in C++ this weekend because I just, I uh, forgot that it's capitalized. All right, I'm pretty sure that the keyword is actually reversed and not reversed. Uh, yeah, in fact, this looks like it worked. It's now sorted in the reverse order. So the fastest hurricane is first, then the medium, and then the slowest. So it's just uh, rearranged these dictionaries. So they're in that order. So keyword reverse. All right, for the next example, I've gone ahead and added a little um, mistake to my hurricane list. Um, in hurricane C, uh, someone forgot to enter the speed. And what do we do in this case? So if I go and just try this, I'm going to copy my sorted hurricanes get speed method. I'm going to get an error. It's going to say that it's a 
should be um, a key error because there is no speed in this um, hurricane right here. Let's see here, key error speed. Yep, there it is, key error. Uh, so when I tried to look up that key, not present. So what I wanna do is go ahead and fix my get speed function so that if the speed isn't there, it's just gonna return zero. All right, now hopefully this was kind of obscure. Well, I think I mentioned it exactly one time, probably three weeks ago. So if you guys can remember how to do that, that's amazing. Uh, and if not, it might be time to review for the, we've got an exam a week from Wednesday. All right, so I'm just gonna go back up. I'm gonna go to my get speed function and update this. So pause the video, see if you can remember how to do this. And if not, come back and watch and get some review. All right, so the secret is that uh, here I'm using a key lookup using the brackets. What I'm gonna do instead is use the get method to get the speed and this one lets me put in a default value so that means if speed is not present if it's not one of the keys then it's going to return this value instead okay so i've just updated this formula i need to control enter to update it and now i can see it already changed this because i just ran this cell that changed my hurricane list according to python so now when i run this cell like this when it sorts it, it's gonna get a speed of zero to be used for sorting. So it's gonna put all of the hurricanes without a speed first, and then it's gonna list them from smallest to greatest. All right, one final example here. Uh, here I have a list of characters, and uh, lists of strings are actually really common. We may have a list of names. Some of them might be capitalized, some of them might be lowercase, some of them might be like all caps, shouted names. Um, but the idea here is that I want to sort that entire list of names so that they look good. So they're in alphabetical order. If I just call the sorted function on a list of characters like this, what it's going to do is say that all of the capital letters, A and C, come before all of the lowercase letters. So it's still going to get kind of a mixed up string. I've got like everything that begins with a capital letter will be sorted at first, and everything that begins with a lowercase letter will be sorted and second, in fact, here, let me switch this around. We'll switch this to D and B to just verify that the sorted is working. It did, in fact, move the B in front of D. But I still have all of the uppercase letters in front of the lowercase letters. So the idea here is we want to pass some kind of string method to sorted that it can call on these functions or these characters. And remember, when we give sorted a keyword, here, in fact, I'm going to just go ahead like this, make a new copy. We'll do it right here in this cell. Um, when we give it a, that, that key equals something, this is going to be a function that returns a value that I'm going to put on the left side and right side of a less than. So in this case, I've got capital A less than capital D. That's true. Low, I'm sorry, lowercase d. Lowercase d less than capital C. That's false. It's going to switch them. All right, so that's the idea here. Now, in order to call a string method, um, I can't just like give it the name of a string dot something. Let's go with lower. I suppose upper would work too. Your choice. They both work. We'll just sort them all by first converting the letter into uppercase or lowercase. And then um, using that as our uh, operands for less than. Okay. Now, if you remember just up above, we had this is a string method. So in order to get uh, just the function of a string method, I need to tell it that it comes from this module. So string.upper. Uh, now this should go ahead and sort all the strings. So regardless of whether they begin with a capital letter or a lowercase letter, they're gonna appear in alphabetical order. All right, hope that's clear, quick review. Um, this might be useful in an upcoming project. So just stick that in the back of your mind. Might be useful on an upcoming exam. All right, this is going to do it for me today. Have a fantastic day, everybody, and I will see you soon.